Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our God, our strength, and our redeemer. So, this morning's sermon is going to contain many things, including a little bit of conversation about aliens. Uh, we're not talking about the Yeti Project or anything like that, but it's an important concept in the Old Testament. And it's at the heart of Thanksgiving and of Harvest Thanksgiving. So, I want to start off with our reading from Deuteronomy where we talk about bringing first fruits. And one of the things we might not think about when we're talking about first fruits is the realization is that right up until the first fruits come, people are often in a very hungry position. You know, it's only in the last 150 or so years that any kind of refrigeration on a mass scale was available. So what you did at the end of every harvest year and in the early winter months is you packed as much food away as you could and tried to make it last as long as you possibly could. There was no weekly trip to the supermarket to buy your groceries. You try to get as much time as possible out of the food. So when first fruits come, when the first bits of the harvest come, that's the point when you have the least amount of food in your house. And you're just waiting for that harvest to come. So in our Deuteronomy reading, we hear the people being told, bring the first fruits of your harvest. And they're also often the best. You know when you get that first couple of tomatoes or something like that from your garden? They're the best ones. They're the tastiest ones. And bring that before the priest and dedicate that as an offering to God. And while you're doing that, you have to remember something. You have to remember that you were a wandering tribe that ended up down in Egypt. And while you were in Egypt, you were treated, and this is the first time you hear this word, as an alien. Now, it doesn't mean a creature from outer space. It means you were treated as a stranger. You were treated as somebody not quite like the Egyptians. Somebody who couldn't be trusted. And you were made to work for all those years. And you were held in a bitter bondage. But then you were brought out from that. And as you remember that, you make this pledge before God. But then you go from that encounter with the priest and the blessing of the food and the call to remembrance of that time in Egypt. And you're told to take that food home and to share it. To share it with your family, those around you, which would not best be sort of like the four or five people that live in your house. Your family would be a much larger unit, extended family as we call it now. With the Levites, because the Levites weren't given any land. And the promise made to them was, if you come and you serve God here, and you wait in the temple, you will be looked after. You will not have land, you will not have that land inheritance, but you will be looked after. And thirdly, to share it with the alien who resides among you. This is different from how they were treated in Egypt when they were aliens. That model 
is not your model. How the Egyptians treated you, making you slaves to build their buildings, is not the model that you are supposed to use when you deal with strangers that are living in your country. They become part of the feast. They are welcomed at the table. They don't get the scraps. They don't get the leftovers. They're part of the dinner. But there's something else that's embedded in this process. We just noticed that the Feast of the First Fruits comes just when all the other food is running out. And the first thing they're told to do after coming for this blessing, after coming and presenting the first fruits before God, is to take it and share it. Share it widely. Share it generously. Share it not just with those that are nearest and dearest to them, but to share it with everybody even the complete stranger. It's an article of faith for them. We are going to trust God so much that rather than saying, okay, we've got this great new harvest, let's make sure we get stuff put away first. We're going to share it with everybody around us. We are going to trust that God will provide for us in the harvest that is coming. Because the first fruits is only just the beginning of the harvest. The rest of the harvest is still to come. This decision, this practice of making sure that there's food for the family, that there's food for the Levites, that there's food for the aliens among them, is an act of faith that God is going to make sure that they are cared for. And it's, it's hard for us to do. We like the concept, because we see this actually in our Gospel reading. Our Gospel reading today comes just after John's telling of the feeding of the 5,000. One of those few stories that's included in all four Gospels. And Jesus says the people coming, like, you know, Jesus leaves in the middle of the, of the night and the people go searching for him. And Jesus, in his quite typical fashion, doesn't say, yeah, I just need a little rest. He says, why are you looking for me? Are you looking for me because you want to know what I have to say? Do you want to follow after me? Do you want to be my followers? No, I know why you've come. Because you had a really full meal yesterday. And you're looking for a repeat. And while that may seem on the surface like, well, let's follow this guy, he can do this for us. It's, it's not really a trusting response in terms of looking at how God will provide. You know, one of the interesting things about the entry into the Promised Land is as soon as the Israelites enter the Promised Land, the manna stops. God is going to provide for them. But God's going to provide in a different way. God's always going to provide, but the ways in which God provides 
will be different in different times and in different places. And they've been reminded. God, let's go back to this Deuteronomy again. Share. Share with your family, with the Levites, and with the aliens. God will provide. It's going to be different from when you were wandering through the desert. And one of the things to remember, actually, as they wandered through the desert was when you pick up the manna every day, you only take enough manna for that day. It will be there tomorrow, a fresh supply. And of course, we see people who aren't willing to accept that. And so they start to hoard the manna. And they open it up the next day and it's rotten and full of bugs. But the one day, of course, is the day before the Sabbath. Then you take two days worth. And you will not have to go around picking up on the Sabbath. So God's methods and means of provision change over time. But God will always provide. And God calls us into that provision process. We are given the opportunity to demonstrate God's loving provision by the ways in which we provide for each other. And our model should be the generosity that God asked of his people back in the book of Deuteronomy. Back, by the way, before they entered the promised land. They haven't even got there. Thanksgiving is rooted in the idea that everything we have is a gift from God. And therefore, we give thanks. But it's not just a matter of words. Thanksgiving is a demonstration that we believe everything we have is a gift from God. It's a demonstration that God not only provides, but God will provide through us Again, we'll go back, even before the story of Deuteronomy, we'll go back to the story of Abraham, where Abraham is blessed to be a blessing. Thanksgiving is our opportunity to remind ourselves that we are blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed for our own sake. We're not blessed to keep it all to ourselves. We're blessed to be a blessing. And then further in our gospel, Jesus, after talking to people, is saying, you know, you think Moses gave you the manna, but it wasn't. God gave the man. Moses was just the person who told you, told you about it. 
And of course, you go, oh, well, hey, give us this. We want that all the time. We want this kind of bread all the time. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I have come to give you a food that does not corrupt. A food that does not destroy, does not waste away. He is that food. We will come to the table in a few minutes to celebrate and to remember that Jesus is that food. It's a food that transforms us. It's a food that changes us. It too is a gift from God. It too is a gift that is meant to bless us so that we can bless everyone else. Each other as well. We call this prayer the great thanksgiving. Because we pray as we remember the greatest gift. And all our thanksgivings all of the meals that we share together, where we gather and give thanks for what we have, are a reflection of this meal. And the best way to take this meal with us, because this is a meal that doesn't go bad, To dine at Christ's table, the bread there is always living bread. It's not going to go moldy if you leave it out. Christ is the living bread that we eat. And the best way to celebrate and to commemorate that is to take it with us into the world. To share it, not just in words and even in actions, but to take it and share it when we share food, clothing, housing, whatever it is that needs to be shared, that we realize and we act that this is the bread of life which has come down from heaven. And so we have been blessed by it so that we can bless the world around.